Chapter 5, Part 1 of Explorers and Travelers by Adolphus W. Greeley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by William Tomko. Chapter 5, Captain Meriwether Lewis and Lieutenant William Clark. Part 1, First Transcontinental Explorers of the United States. The burning genius and intense patriotism of Thomas Jefferson found their most brilliant setting in his draft of the most famous paper in the world, the Declaration of Independence. If Jefferson thus struck the keynote of freedom for America, he was not content with the free people restricted in their habitat to the eastern half of the continent, and in his ripest life gave no more conspicuous evidence of his foresight and statesmanship than in the inauguration of a policy which comprehended in its scope the exploration and settlement of the entire trans-Mississippi region. He not only urged and completed the purchase of Louisiana, but sought the extent of its natural resources, appreciated the undeveloped wealth of the Great West, and drafted a scheme of land divisions and settlement which foreshadowed the beneficial homestead legislation of later years. Jefferson was for years interested in the exploration of the western parts of North America, which were absolutely unknown save the coastline of the Pacific. In 1784, while in Paris, he met John Ledyard, who had made an unsuccessful effort to organize a company for the fur trade on the western coast of america ledyard by jefferson's advice and intercession attempted to cross by land to kamchatka and thence to the west coast of america and across country to the missouri river ledyard's arrest in siberia and expulsion from the country by the russian government ended his plan in eighteen o two jefferson initiated through the american philosophical society a subscription for the exploration of the western parts of north america by ascending the missouri river crossing the rocky mountains and descending the nearest river to the pacific ocean although only two persons were to go meriwether lewis urgently sought the appointment and with m andre michaud the voyage was commenced but his companion being recalled by the french minister at washington the journey was abandoned on january eighteenth eighteen o three jefferson then president recommended in a confidential message to congress modifications of the act regarding trade with indians and with the view of extending its provisions to the indians on the missouri recommended the exploration of the missouri river to its source the crossing of the rocky mountains and descent to the pacific ocean by the best water communication congress approved the plan and voted money for its accomplishment captain meriwether lewis of the united states army who had been for nearly two years private secretary to the president renewed his solicitations for command which was given him jefferson showed his versatility in the instructions to captain lewis which are a model of fullness and clearness the route to be followed, natural products and possibilities, animal, vegetable, and mineral, climatic conditions, commercial routes, the soil and face of the country were all dwelt on. The character, customs, disposition, territory occupied, tribal relations, means of subsistence, language, clothing, disease, moral attributes, laws, traditions, religion, intellectuality, extent and means of trade, war methods, with respect to the Indian tribes visited, were to be studied and reported. The topography of the country was to be accurately determined astronomically and otherwise, and the maps and notes multiplied to avoid total loss. The good will of the chiefs was to be sought, peaceful methods pursued, and the inflexible opposition of any extensive force promising bloodshed was to be met by withdrawal and retreat the country then being outside the limits of the united states passports from the ministers of great britain spain and france were furnished meriwether lewis was born august seventeenth seventeen seventy four near charlottesville virginia being the son of john lewis and miss meriwether and grandnephew of fielding lewis who married a sister of george washington volunteering at the age of twenty in the militia called out by washington to put down the shea rising he was made ensign of the second sub-legion may first seventeen ninety five and appointed in first infantry november seventeen ninety six where he rose to be paymaster and captain in eighteen hundred 
He was a considerate and efficient officer, an expert hunter, versed in natural history, familiar with Indian character and customs. Appreciating his deficiencies in certain branches of science important in this expeditionary duty, he at once sought instruction from competent professors. Jefferson describes Lewis as follows. Of courage undaunted, possessing a firmness and perseverance of purpose which nothing but impossibilities could divert from its direction. Honest, disinterested, liberal, of sound understanding, and a fidelity to truth so scrupulous that whatever he should report would be as certain as seen ourselves. The management and success of the expedition, it may here be said, fully justified the selection by and encomiums of Jefferson. Lewis, given his choice of associate, selected William Clark, who was appointed by Jefferson second lieutenant of artillery. Clark was a brother of George Rogers Clark, by whose valor and sagacity the Illinois or Northwest Territory was secured to the United States, and this connection made his selection for further extension of the country seem most fitting. Moreover, young Clark had qualifications and experiences which strongly commended him to Lewis. Born in Virginia, August 1, 1770, William Clark had a thorough knowledge of the privations and conditions of frontier life. Skillful as a hunter, a keen observer, familiar with military life from four years of service as a lieutenant of infantry, and developed from his ill health, which caused him to leave the army in 1796, into a magnificent specimen of manhood, he proved so efficient a co-adjuster that his name will ever be inseparably associated with that of Lewis. Lewis left Washington July 5, 1803 his mission being enhanced in its importance by the formal cession of louisiana to the united states by the treaty of paris april thirtieth eighteen o three which news reached him july first the rendezvous was at st louis which was reached via pittsburgh and the ohio recruits being selected at various posts while lieutenant clark joined at louisville though he was not commissioned in the army till the following march when the party reached St. Louis in December 1803, formal notice of the transfer of Louisiana had not reached the Spanish commandant, who would not permit their passage westward. They passed the winter in camp opposite the mouth of the Mississippi, where they built a barge with sail power and two smaller boats, with which they started up the Missouri River on May 14, 1804. The expedition commanded by Captain Lewis, with Lieutenant Clark as second, comprised thirty-four selected men, eleven being watermen, a negro servant, and a hunter who was also an interpreter. The valley of the lower Missouri was well known to the French Canadians, who, pushed westward by the eruption of English settlers in the Illinois region, sought isolation and freedom from foreign restraint in the country west of the Mississippi. St. Louis was their headquarters, but the Missouri was their field of fortune. The village of St. Charles, with its single street, had about 500 souls who lived by hunting and trade with the Indians, agriculture being quite neglected, and an outpost of seven poverty-stricken families existed at La Charette, the advance guard of civilization. But the typical French trader and trapper disdained the shelter of a roof and the restraint of communities. His adventurous spirit pushed his frail bark into the quiet waters of the upper Kansas, through the shallows of the Platte, under the overshading trees of the beautiful James, along the precipitous red clay cliffs of the Big Sioux, and, in search of the beaver, even penetrated the winding narrows of the Cheyenne and Little Missouri. They did not even stop at transient visits, but, fascinated by the roving, aimless life of the savage, took up abode with him, shared his teepee and wanderings, adopted his customs, took his squaw to wife, until longings strange and uncontrollable drew them back in old age to the home and religion of their youth. One of these venturesome wanderers, named Durian, who had lived twenty years among the Sioux, was picked up on the river and accompanied Lewis to the mouth of the James as a much-needed interpreter. The mouth of the Platte was passed on July 21st, and on the next day, Lewis camped on the site of the present city of Council Bluffs, thus named by Lewis on account of his council with the Ottos and Missouri Indians at this point.
Here the first of a continuing series of presents was given to the Grand Chief, an American flag, a large medal which was placed around his neck as a mark of consideration, paint, garters, cloth ornaments, a canister of powder, and the indispensable bottle of whiskey. The subordinate chiefs received inferior medals and presents according to their importance. These presents were made with much form and ceremony, wherein an important part were speeches setting forth the transfer of the territory to the United States, the benefits of peace, and the advantages of trade at the new post to be occupied by Americans. Both Lewis and Clark had been accustomed to Indian life on the eastern frontiers, but they found much that was strange and striking among the denizens of the great interior plains. Beyond the breechcloth, a loose buffalo robe usually kept the savage from nudity, the necklace of grizzly bear claws, the ornaments of porcupine and feathers, the scalp poles, the conical teepees covered with gaily figured skins, the blue smoke upcurling from the open tent top, the hoop tambourine or half drum, the queer whip rattle of the hooves of goats and deer, the bladder rattle full of pebbles, the shaven heads of the men, the white dressed buffalo robe with its jingling rows of porcupine quills and uncouth painted figures, emblematic of the brave's war history, the hawk feather or eagle plume headdress worked with porcupine quills, the polecat skin trailing from the young brave's moccasins the deer paunch tobacco pouch and a score of other novelties met their observing eyes among the rickeries the octagonal earth-covered lodges the picketed villages the cultivated patches of corn beans and potatoes the basket-like boats of interwoven boughs covered with a single buffalo skin in which squaws paddled unconcernedly over high waves were unknown phases of savage life even the earth gave up its treasure, and they found the first of the famous petrifications of the Trans-Missouri region in the backbone of a fish 45 feet long in a perfect state. Game gradually grew plentiful as they ascended the river. Buffalo was not seen till the Big Sioux was reached, but later 15 herds and three bands of elk were visible at one time, and near Mandan large flocks of goats were seen crossing from their summer grazing grounds to find west of the Missouri winter shelter in the hilly regions. As they passed, the Indians drove large flocks of migrating goats into the river, where even boys killed the helpless animals by scores with sticks. Indeed, the Missouri then appears to have been a hunter's paradise, for there are mentioned among the regular game antelope, bear, beaver, buffalo, badger, deer, elk, goats, and porcupine. Three thousand antelope were seen at one time, and of this animal Lewis accurately remarks, the antelope possesses most wonderful swiftness the acuteness of their sight distinguishes the most distant danger the delicate sensibility of their smell defeats the precautions of concealment and when alarmed their rapid career seems more like the flight of birds than the movements of an earthly being the river furnished abundant supply of cat and buffalo fish and feathered game such as plover grouse geese turkeys ducks and pelican also abounded among the vegetable products are enumerated several kinds of grapes currants and plums wild apples bilberries cherries gooseberries mulberries raspberries acorns and hazelnuts as regards the voyage thus far it was true that the sail could rarely be used that the labor of propelling the boats by oar or pole was most laborious and that the shallows gave great trouble but the indians save a single threatening occasion were most friendly and the only death that of sergeant floyd was from acute disease indeed the journey had been most attractive and free from special hazard and when rapidly advancing winter obliged them to go into permanent quarters on october twenty seventh it seemed rather a long hunting excursion than a dangerous voyage of discovery their winter quarters called fort mandan were on the eastern side of the missouri sixteen hundred miles from st louis and in latitude forty seven degrees twenty two minutes north a short distance above the present city of bismarck the buildings were wooden huts which joined and formed two sides of a triangle while the third side was of pickets as the huts opened inward they had a stockaded place easy of defence 
On his arrival at Fort Mandan, Lewis found a Mr. McCracken of the Hudson Bay Company engaged in trading for horses and buffalo robes. During the winter, ten or twelve different traders of this company visited Mandan, and although one bore a letter from the chief factor, Mr. Charles Chabouilles, offering any service in his power, yet it was evident to Lewis that these traders were cultivating sentiments unfriendly to Americans among the Indians, and Chabonneau, the interpreter, was tampered with. But the prompt and judicious action of Lewis resulted in apologies and promises to refrain from such conduct in future. La Roche, one of the Hudson Bay traders, desired to go west with the expedition, but it was thought best to decline the offer. At this time, the nearest English trading post was at the forks of the Assiniboine, about 150 miles distant by the way of Mouse River. The stay at Fort Mandan was marked by two sad experiences for the Indians encamped near the post, an autumnal prairie fire which burned two Indians to death, and an attack of the Sioux wherein one Mandan was killed and two wounded. A Frenchman, Jassome, living with the Indians, served as interpreter, and they learned much of the Mandans, Rickeries, and Minitaries. The Rickeries appeared in a very sensible light by refusing spirits, with the remark that they did not use it, and were surprised that their father should present to them a liquor which would make them fools. The sensibilities of these Indians in their peculiar way appeared in a chief who cried bitterly at seeing a court-martial sentence of flogging carried out on a soldier. The chief acknowledged the necessity of exemplary punishment, and said that for the same offense he had killed his braves, but that he never whipped any one, not even children. The Mandans, through intervention, made peace with the Rickeries, and restored traps and furs which they had taken from French hunters. During the entire winter, these Indian tribes were most friendly, and their stores of corn, obtained by the expeditionary force by trade or purchase, were of material benefit to the party. The Negro was a constant source of wonder to the crowds of Indians who visited them. The one-eyed great chief of the Minitaries said that some foolish young men had told him there was a person quite black. When York, the Negro, appeared, the one-eyed savage, much surprised, examined the Negro closely, and, spitting on a finger, rubbed the skin in order to wash off the paint, and it was not until the Negro showed him his curly hair that the Indian could be persuaded he was not a painted white man. Game, though at some distance, was abundant, and seventy head of large animals were obtained in a hunt of ten days. With regard to the Indians, Lewis says, a camp of Mandans caught within two days one hundred goats a short distance below us. Their mode of hunting them is to form a large strong pen or fold from which a fence is made of bushes gradually widening on each side. The animals are surrounded by the hunters and gently driven toward this pen, in which they imperceptibly find themselves enclosed and are then at the mercy of the hunters. When the Indians engage in killing buffalo, the hunters mount on horseback and, armed with bows and arrows, encircle the herd and gradually drive it into a plain or open place fit for the movement of horse. They then ride in among them and, signaling out a buffalo, a female being preferred, go as close as possible and wound her with arrows till they think they have given the mortal stroke, when they pursue another till the quiver is exhausted. If, which rarely happens, the wounded buffalo attacks the hunter, he evades the blow by the agility of his horse, which is trained for the combat with great dexterity. The winter proved to be of unusual severity, and several times the temperature fell to forty degrees below zero, and proof spirits froze into hard ice. The fortitude with which the hardy savages withstood such extreme cold, half naked as they often were, impressed our explorers. Spring opened early, and on August 7, 1805, Fort Mandan was abandoned, one party of ten with the barge going down the river with dispatches and specimens. Lewis and Clark, with their party of thirty, started up the Missouri in six canoes and two large open boats, which had been constructed by them. They had three interpreters, Drewyer, Chabonneau, and his wife. 
Druyer was a Canadian half-breed who had always lived in the woods, and while he had inherited from his mother the intuitive sagacity of the Indian in following the faintest trail, he had also acquired to a wonderful degree that knowledge of the shifts and expedients of camp life which is the resource and pride of the frontier huntsman. Chavano's life had been largely spent among the Blackfeet, by whom his wife, a snake Indian, had been taken in war and enslaved when a young girl. At the mouth of the Little Missouri, the three French hunters, who had ventured to follow the party, stopped for trapping, as they found beaver very plentiful. Chavano Creek, the farthest point in the Missouri yet visited by white men, was passed, and on April 26th they arrived at the mouth of the Yellowstone. Lewis was here particularly pleased with the wide plains, interspersed with forests of various trees, and expressed his opinion that the situation was most suitable for a trading establishment. Spring had now fairly opened, the trees were in leaf, a flower was seen, and despite the scanty verdure of the new grass, game was very abundant. In many places, however, the barren banks and sandbars were covered with a white incrustation of alkali salts, looking like frost or newly fallen snow, which were present in such quantities that all the small tributaries of the Missouri proved to be bitter and unhealthy water. Signs of human life became rarer, but now and then they passed an old Indian camp, and near one saw the burial place of an Indian woman. The body, carefully wrapped in dressed buffalo robes, rested on a high scaffold with two sleds and harness over it. Nearby lay the remains of a dog sacrificed to the shades of his dead mistress. In the bag were articles fitting for women, moccasins, red and blue paint, beaver's nails, scrapers for dressing hides, dried roots, a little mandan tobacco, and several plates of sweet-smelling grass. The oar was plied unceasingly, save when a favoring wind filled their sails and facilitated their progress. In early May, they drew up their canoes for the night at the mouth of a bold, beautiful stream, and in the abundant timber found feeding on the young willows so many clumsy porcupines that they called it Porcupine River. Game was present in vast quantities. The elk were tame, and the male buffalo would scarcely quit grazing at the approach of man. As Lewis remarks, it has become an amusement to supply the party with provisions. On May 8th, they dined at the mouth of a river flowing from a level, well-watered, and beautiful country. As the water had a peculiar whiteness, they were induced to call it Milk River. The Missouri now turned to the southwest and south. The country became more open, and timber of pine mostly small and scanty. Although the buffalo were so tame and harmless that the men drove them out of their way with sticks, yet the grizzly bear never failed to be a dangerous and vicious visitor. One day, six good hunters attacked a grizzly, and four firing at forty paces, each lodged a shell in the body, two going through the lungs. The animal ran at them furiously when the other hunters fired two balls into him, breaking a shoulder. The bear yet pursued them driving two into a canoe and the others into thickets from which they fired as fast as they could reload. Turning on them, he drove two so closely that they dropped their guns and sprang from a precipice twenty feet high into the river, followed by the bear, who finally succumbed to a shot through the head after eight balls had passed completely through his body. Another bear, shot through the heart, ran a quarter of a mile with undiminished speed before he fell dead. End of chapter 5, part 1. Recording by William Tomko.